California is a state with a population the size larger than the entire United States in 1870. At that point in the US, we had already gone through a civil war and we were starting on an age of industrialism and becoming a world leader. California, by itself, has the 30th biggest population of any other country, the 5th largest economy in the world, and by all means is a major world leader in all categories. That being said, you could find countless biographies on nearly any of our past presidents. The same cannot be said for California governors. Men who have had just as much of an impact on the course of our states, our countries, and our world's history. I think it's important, as Californians, that we remember these men. Remembering them, to us, is just as important as remembering any president. Before we start, I'd like to ask you all to like this video and subscribe to my channel. It really does help. Starting off, Peter Hardiman Burnett was the first governor of California, serving from 1849 to 1851. Burnett was a slaveholder and a lawyer, originally from Missouri and Tennessee, but after falling into debt, he moved to the Oregon Territory in order to claim the free land that the government promised settlers. Burnett rose the ranks of the newly established Oregon state government, even joining the Supreme Court of the state. But after gold was discovered in California, Burnett moved and helped establish the city of Sacramento. He ran for and was elected the first governor of the state with less than 7,000 votes and 47% of the popular vote as an independent Democrat. As governor, Burnett tried to stomp out the Native American population and even tried to exclude African Americans from entering the state, given that he wasn't allowed to own them. After he gave his first State of the State address, which was poorly received by the legislature, he chose to resign, later joining the Supreme Court of California and dying at age 88. Lieutenant Governor John McDougall became governor after Burnett's resignation. McDougall was originally from Ohio. He served in the Black Hawk War at age 14 and later served in the Mexican-American War and moved to California as a gold miner. McDougal served on California's Constitutional Convention and reluctantly accepted becoming lieutenant governor, afraid that the office was irrelevant. McDougal was an independent Democrat and largely continued Burnett's racist policies, except towards the Chinese, which he welcomed for their labor. McDougal opposed banning dueling, saying that duelers were unfit to live and would kill each other off eventually. After leaving office, he was in two duels, surviving each. He died at 48 years old. John Bigler was a Democratic newspaper editor originally from Pennsylvania. He was very popular and served a full two terms. The legislature even named a lake in the Sierras Bigler in his honor. Later, the lake's name was changed to Tahoe. He was an advocate for immigrants as governor and highly supported immigration, except from the Chinese, which he tried banning. Afterwards, J. Neely Johnson defeated Bigler in his bid for a third term. Johnson was a Whig. At just 30 years old, he is also the youngest man ever elected governor of the state. After his one term, Johnson went into Nevada politics and later died at just 47 years old. Senator John Weller was elected governor of California in 1857, right before the Civil War. Weller said that if Civil War did come, California would secede. Luckily, he left office in 1860, right before the war broke out, being replaced by Milton Latham. Latham, 32 years old, was a pro-Southern Democrat. Many feared that he, like Weller, would support secession and slavery. The legislature elected him as senator to fill the then-vacant seat, and Latham resigned the governorship just five days into his term in order to join the Senate. Lieutenant Governor John Downey, a pro-Southern Democrat like Latham and Weller, originally from Ireland, took office after Latham's resignation. Though Downey ultimately backed the Union, he was lukewarm about it, and that ultimately lost him the 1861 election. One of the few things that Downey is remembered for is that he once got in a fist fight with a heckler during one of his speeches. Leland Stanford was the first Republican governor of California. He was extremely wealthy, worth about $1.7 billion in today's money. He was one of the big four businessmen who funded the Transcontinental Railroad, was a well-known philanthropist, and he and his wife founded Stanford University in honor of their dead son. As governor, Stanford reformed the state constitution, supported forest conservation, cut the state's debt in half, 
and made the governor's term into four years from the short two-year terms before. He did all this in just two years. Stanford was also extremely racist and continued the native genocide and the subjugation of Chinese immigrants from previous democratic terms, a terrible stain on an otherwise honorable legacy. After his two years as governor, Stanford went on to be elected senator, dying in that position at age 69. Frederick Lowe was a unionist who served one four-year term from 1863 to 1867. During his time, he was solidly Republican in his policies and was actually fairly progressive, establishing Yosemite National Park as well as the University of California college system. He died in 1894. Afterwards, Henry Haight, a Democrat, took the governor's office. Though Haight helped bring down the state's debts, he was also extremely racist and opposed non-white suffrage, rejecting non-whites' rights to vote or basically have any of the other civil liberties they were entitled to. Newton Booth was the second governor to resign after being elected to the Senate while still in the governor's office, following Milton Latham. Booth had an overall unremarkable term other than the fact that he openly tried to get African American votes while running for office something that none of the previous candidates had done in the start of a movement towards civil rights in the state. Romaldo Pacheco took over when Booth resigned. Born in 1831 Santa Barbara, he is the first California-born governor as well as the first Mexican-American governor. He spent much of his early childhood in Hawaii, but made his way back to California and slowly climbed basically every rank of California politics before becoming lieutenant governor, only to serve the last 10 months of Booth's term. Pacheco later went on to the U.S. Congress, served as envoy to Central America under President Ben Harrison, and retired in Oakland, where he lived until his 1899 death. William Irwin came after Pacheco and had a really uneventful term in which he resisted the switch to paper money in favor of silver and gold instead. George Perkins also served a single term, from 1880 to 1883. While in office, he pardoned many prisoners, personally interviewing each one. USC and UCLA also opened under his term. George Stoneman was a military man, West Point graduate, and Mexican-American and a Civil War veteran. He was no small deal in the Civil War either, and after moving to California, he was elected governor. As governor, he tried standing up to the growing railroad monopoly, but the legislature, bought by the railroad, quashed all of his efforts. He was also a prisoner's advocate, pardoning 260 and commuting another 150 sentences. After he finished his single term, he retired and moved to New York with his sister, where he died in 1894. William Bartlett was a Democrat who spent 17 years climbing California politics before eventually being elected governor. He served only nine months, though, before dying of Bright's disease. Bartlett was the first, and so far only, Jewish California governor. After Bartlett's death, the lieutenant governor, Robert Waterman, finished off his term in a fairly boring way, one of his few achievements being expanding the California National Guard. Henry William Markham was a veteran of the Civil War, a lawyer and owned a ranch down in Pasadena. When he was elected governor, he faced one of the worst depressions the country had ever seen before the Great Depression, the Depression of 1893. He handled the depression like an expert. He supported business. He hosted a world fair in San Francisco, attracting tens of thousands. And he also cracked down on the massive railroad trusts, which had owned the state millions. All of these things helped to lift California out of the depression and lead as an example to all of the nation. Afterwards, James Budd, a Democrat, was elected. He was the only Democrat who won election in that particular cycle, and so he was basically crippled by all the Republican state legislature, Senate, making it incredibly difficult to do much of anything. Some of the few things he was able to do, though, were impressive and brave, like fighting back against the massive railroad companies and also establishing the Bureau of Highways, he was the last Democrat to be governor for the next 30 years. Henry Gage, as governor, was largely a joke. He denied the existence of the bubonic plague during an outbreak in San Francisco, which of course was the wrong response. And throughout the course of his term, he made many fumbles. 
which made him so unpopular that he wasn't even renominated by his own party in 1902, as George Pardee won the election. He was a good man and a good governor, but overall had an uneventful term. After him came James Gillette. Gillette, unlike Markham, Bud, or Pardee before him, was much more friendly to the Railroad Trust. But besides this, he was overall a good governor. He helped pioneer the state highway system as cars became more and more popular, and he also helped towards prison reform. Gillette decided to serve only one term, like many before and after him, because the governorship does not pay well, and he left office nearly in debt. Hiram Johnson was a deeply anti-corruption lawyer, chosen by the reform wing of Teddy Roosevelt's Republican Party as their candidate for governor. He won with 20,000 votes over his opponent, and this was the first public office he ever held. Johnson served one and a half terms before being sent to the Senate, where he served another 28 years. After Johnson left for the Senate, Lieutenant Governor William Steffens faced a massive challenge. Now he was governor, women were fighting for their right to vote. Prohibition was a massively controversial issue which Steffens happened to support and World War I was starting all at once. In 1917, the governor's mansion was bombed. Later, the Capitol building and the mansion were held for ransom. $50,000 or both would be blown up. Steffens managed to navigate all of these challenges, but wasn't nominated for re-election by the growing conservative wing of the Republican Party. Steffens was succeeded by the very conservative and very Quaker friend Richardson. He vetoed practically all bills which involved spending, even trying to close down some schools and colleges for their costs. All of this conservatism did ultimately make for a $20 million surplus in the state budget, which was extremely important, especially when the Great Depression came under Governor Clement Young, who faced a massive flux of immigrants from the Midwest of America as thousands, hundreds of thousands, were displaced by the Dust Bowl and the Depression. Young handled this crisis very well, along with a number of others like the collapse of the St. Francis Dam, which killed 500. Young also helped establish UCLA and helped support the state's park system. He served only one term though after he was defeated by James Rolfe, the first Democrat since 1899 over 30 years earlier. Rolfe was wildly unpopular. He justified and even supported lynchings. He instituted the first ever sales tax in California, and he ignored prohibition laws. Rolfe died three years into his term and was succeeded by Frank Merriam, a Republican. Merriam was staunchly anti-corruption and anti-lobbyist and fought against those forces for the rest of his less than one year term. Afterwards, Colbert Olson, or an anti-corruption New Deal Democrat, was elected. He was an overall decent governor, keeping in line mostly with FDR's platform. After one term though, he was defeated for a re-election by Earl Warren. Warren was extremely popular. He was really an amazing man, an amazing governor. He ran for governor under no party. He appeared above party politics. He united the left, the right, the center. He supported FDR in his progressivism, in welfare, unemployment, and such. But in many ways, he was also a Republican. He ran alongside Republican Thomas Dewey for vice president in 1948, but ultimately lost. After serving a full two terms and halfway through a third one as governor, he was appointed to the Supreme Court by President Eisenhower. In the court, Warren was chief justice. He helped to organize a unanimous decision in the Brown vs. Board of Education case. He led the Warren Commission investigating JFK's assassination. He was really an amazing man. He is also the only man to have been elected to three consecutive terms as governor in California. After Warren left for the Supreme Court, Goodwin Knight took over as governor. Knight had a somewhat boring term, focusing mostly on water conservation and prison reform. Pat Brown won election by a margin of over one million votes. During his two terms, he was somewhat boring. He started to modernize the state government by encouraging using computers, primitive as they were, and he also focused on water conservation. One of the interesting things about him is that when he ran for re-election, he was running against the recently defeated 1960 candidate for president, Richard Nixon. 
Brown won this election and nearly killed Nixon's political career in doing so. He was also the father of future governor Jerry Brown. Afterwards, Ronald Reagan defeated Brown in a massive landslide. In his two terms, Reagan was wildly popular, and of, of course, he later went on to become president and was even more popular there. Reagan got rid of many mental institutes in California, which many see as the root cause of our modern homeless crisis, letting these thousands of mentally ill and socially rejected people out onto the streets with few places to go. He also, surprisingly, expanded wealth care benefits and increased taxes, though a lot of this could depend on Reagan's need to work with the massive Democratic majority in the state House and Senate. After Reagan's two terms, Jerry Brown, son of Pat, was elected to two terms as governor, during which he'd focus on renewable energy, civil rights, and also labor and especially agricultural labor rights. After his eight years, he tried unsuccessfully running for senator and even later president, but Brown didn't simply retire and would come back later. After Brown's first two terms, George Duke Mason, a Republican, took over. Duke Mason was very successful. He created nearly three million new jobs in California. He introduced a workfare program, basically welfare, but for work. And he also highly prioritized education and a conservative economy. These policies and their successes made him quite popular, making him able to win a full two terms. Later, Senator Pete Wilson, also a Republican and a close political ally of both Nixon and Reagan, took over. He focused on health coverage for employees of small businesses, workers' compensation, and education. And as governor, he was one of the first to use the three strikes law, 25 years to life, for three-time repeat violent offenders, which 28 states now have. Afterwards, Gray Davis was elected to one term, and four years later, he was elected to another. But a little under one year into his second term, and what he's remembered for best, he was recalled, or he might say total recalled, from governorship over his poor handling of the ongoing energy crisis. This resulted in the election of actor Arnold Schwarzenegger as governor. Schwarzenegger was born in Austria, being only the second foreign-born governor since the Irish John Downey, 140 years before. He is best known, of course, for his bodybuilding or his roles in movies like The Terminator. But he had some experience in government and politics, working with Governor Pete Wilson as a counselor on physical fitness and sports, and with President H.W. Bush as chair of a similar committee. As governor, Schwarzenegger was very professional. He put aside acting and all of that during his two terms and was surprisingly liberal, focusing on reducing greenhouse emissions, education, and especially physical education in public schools and raising the minimum wage. Now, Back when Pete Wilson was governor, he put in place a two-term limit for governors. And while it meant Governor Schwarzenegger couldn't run for re-election, it didn't apply to people who were governor before the term limit was in place, like Jerry Brown, for example. And so, in 2010, Brown ran for and won a third term as governor, a thing only Earl Warren before him had done. Brown's second governorship was similar to his first, and he ran for re-election to a fourth term in 2014, which he also won, making for a total of 16 years of service as governor, the longest any has or probably ever will serve. After Brown constitutionally couldn't run for a fifth term, his hand-picked successor, the former mayor of San Francisco and the lieutenant governor, Gavin Newsom, won the post. Newsom had made news in the past as mayor for going against the anti-gay marriage laws in California and across the country by allowing it in San Francisco. Newsom has been governor for the last five years, and he will not be up for re-election in 2026 because of term limits. As governor, Newsom has been highly criticized for his handling of the homeless crisis, high taxes, and also COVID-19 lockdowns. In 2021, he faced a recall election, but survived the attempted recall with over 60% of the popular vote. Now Newsom is considered as a hopeful for the 2028 Democratic nomination for president, and one of the few leaders of the National Democratic Party. Thank you for watching. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I hope that you'll like this video and subscribe to my channel. Thank you all for watching. Goodbye.